Hello, we have examined in our past lectures various uh, functions of human resource management, manpower planning, performance appraisal, recruitment and selection. In this lecture, we will ex explore the dimensions of uh, training and development. Training and development has emerged as an important function of management, more specifically the human resource management. The role and responsibilities, the scope of the activities of the training and development function is certainly evolving. There, is, there cannot be one standard for every organization. However, let's examine the details. At the end of this lecture, I want you to be seeing this, the concept of training and development, <coughs> the assessment of uh, training needs, the skill categories and the training methods, the, the various issues involved with the training and development. Let us start with the definition of training and development. It is any attempt to improve the current or future employee performance. So the question is how we are working towards the current employee performance and how are you assessing the future employee performance? We have seen both at the time of selection as well as for the performance appraisal. But then having assessed, now what do you do? That's the question. The doing comes in terms of increasing every employee's ability to perform. And that can happen through capacity building, through ability development, and providing learning opportunities on the job. So usually by changing the employee's attitude or by increasing his or her knowledge. So we focus on the skill, we focus on the ability, we focus on the attitudes and providing learning opportunities, increasing their knowledge, increasing their skills. So when we start working on skills, ability, knowledge to improve the performance means we are working on this training and development function. But people also use these word organization development as a related field of training and development. So when you see organization development, it deals with design and de you know, delivery of workplace learning opportunities as a whole, the group as a whole, organization as a whole. So creating learning platforms, creating the communication opportunities, such things can be seen as a part of the organizational development. So training and development to be perceived, to be seen as more to do with enhancement of the skills, attitudes, and knowledge of all the people, or maybe at any level, because sometimes training is seen more for workers, more for skill, and development and education is seen more for managers. It may be true in some context, but generally the training and development to be seen as an action at all levels may it be at the workers level, supervisory level, or at the managerial level, but with a very clear focus on enhancing skills and uh, improving the knowledge as well as the creating better attitudes towards themselves, to the others, and to the organization. So when we are thinking about good performance uh, of through a training program, one need to start with organizational analysis. So one need to see what are the business models of the organization, what are the strategic goals of the organization, what are the short-term and long-term planning of the organization, which we have discussed earlier. So it starts with broad understanding of the organization and translating that organization analysis to the training needs in terms of the how many people, how many skill sets, at what level of uh, performance and things like that. So that means based upon an assessment of the organizational analysis, one would do the 
more assess the more uh, an assessment of corporate and the individual goals. So based on the expectations of the organization, we try and see what the actions are required at different groups, different divisions, different levels within the division and finally boiling down to the individual level. So it moves to the specific tasks. Objectives should be phrased in terms of specific behavioral criteria. So we want to be, we should be able to define very clearly the specific skill sets, specific attitudes and specific knowledge what the group or individual supposed to have. I think that helps in designing a good program. Further, employee analysis is also equally important. So that means the which employees already know, which employees already have that required uh, knowledge but no attitudes, but some have good attitudes but no knowledge. So such analysis also helps in designing better training programs. Then the other important thing is to e explore the pre-training environment. Pre-training environment is what value does management place on training? Is it nice thing to do? It is good that all others are doing, sh we should also do. What kind of value proposition the organization perceives from training? I think that is an important statement to be articulated and to be understood. If the organization policies the the, how do they see it as? The more the training session, the higher the opinion about them. This is the, you know, sometimes the you will see that the organization is very, very intensive on training and development activities. Another time you just do it. And is it uh, focusing on the supervisor attitudes or is it focusing on the worker skills? So it is the, then what kind of resources, what kind of infrastructure is available for training activities? One should also see the pre-training attributes of the trainees. So what are the differences in ability? Are there any generational gaps? Are there any other excellent people? So what are their, you know, the, you know, what are their capabilities? If you see cognitive abilities, if it is better, that means it increases in training success. So basically the individuals are able to comprehend. Self-efficacy, where people we have explored this, high self-efficacy leads to training success, where the individual work towards their own self-improvements. And also the motivation, high motivation, high recognition of need to learn leads to the training success. So it is important to see the trainee's motivation. Why do they come for the program? What is that they would like to achieve from this? So the question is, in understanding their needs, if you can also address those needs, such programs will be more successful. So the decision regarding the training program must have a view of the trainees. The other important thing is the, the, the kind of see contextual view that job involvement, you know, so that is the self-identity is closely linked to the work as well as learning. And similarly, the locus of control. We have talked about this locus of control when we have explored the dimension of personality. So some are considered having external locus of control where they believe in luck believe in uh, chances, explain their success or failure in terms of external things. That is what is the external locus of control. Then there are people who are also called as internal locus of control. They believe in their own actions. They explain success or failure in terms of their understanding, effort and contribution. So the idea is that we must see the, the, the whether they are able to uh, come, you know, work with their internal locus of control. That is what is linked to the training success. And the, the analysis should lead to the 
thinking about what are the scope, what are the activities under this training and development. In some organizations, the term used is learning and development uh, instead of this uh, training and development. The importance of learning is, is key there and that means it is the responsibility is more towards the individual. So the development contributes towards the organization. And similarly, the, if you see there are views about training and development, non-managers are much more likely to be trained in the technical skills. That means more job related things required for their current job. But while managers frequently receive assistance in uh, developing the skills or like this they are enabled or they are facilitated, things like that, when you talk at the manager's level. And the need to train new or recently promoted employees is always self-evident because the gap between what they have and what is uh, required. So induction training and also the training before the uh, assignment are again where the employees have to learn new skills, uh, new understanding of the context. So the motivations are likely to be high during that situation. So that means you know it is there is a high involvement and they can be acquainted very clearly with the, the best of the skills and the kind of behaviors expected in their new positions. So the training and development would be more relevant, more useful. And similarly that the training experience employees you know, if you see to make the performance more effective, always is problematic because as you know in our learning curve, up to a certain degree you can achieve the initial success. But a lot depends upon the individual. So we need to see how to understand how to deal with both the problem employees and also people with, with experience and then how to, how to cover, how to work with them. So when such training needs are uh, developed, the individuals involved may resent being asked to change their established ways of doing their jobs because they may say that we have worked for years, we have done like this in the past, why suddenly you are questioning about our leadership or about communication or about our writing ability. So many of these things can come with the experienced uh, people. So the the more the experience, more uh, the education, more challenge, uh, it becomes much more challenging and problematic for this training and development function. So that means we need to be much more innovative in designing of the programs. The skill categories when we see, we are using these words, the skill, the knowledge, the attitudes, but it is more when we see the skill categories, one can classify that into technical, interpersonal, problem solving kind of a thing. So when you see the technical skills, it depends on the job and very clearly the kind of task the individual is supposed to perform and then you can link that very clearly to the technical skills. It could be the speed, it could be the efficiency, it could be the use of the particular material and operating a particular machine and storing and sorting in certain fashion, very specific to the job. The technical skills are, are imparted at the induction level. Technical skills are also given as and when some of the new technologies are introduced. Sometimes the technical skills are also enhanced through providing opportunities where people can experiment. The, the next important thing is if you see apart from this, uh, the making that kind of, you know, whether the, the general background material like this, mathematical, other abilities, that means we are also talking about some more competencies required to impart those technical skills. So that means there is a preparatory skills and there are also some of the application skills. So, but today when you look at the technical skills, the majority of the jobs 
have become more complex than what it used to be today. So because of the computerization, because of the new digitally controlled uh, machines, maybe it's RFID reader or it may be other uh, sensors which are put at the workplace. So that means because the several of the jobs do deploy several technologies and also one should know how to work with, how to operate some of these things. So the more sophisticated technologies, so that means the you know, employees have to master the required uh, the process skills or the analytical skills and also definitely the computer skills. When you see the interpersonal skills, it is uh, considered today that everyone is supposed to be good at this. People refer to it as EQ. People also talk about as that is team skill sets. So the, but as long as the individual works in an interdependent way and most of the tasks are becoming interdependent, so the question is that the individual has to work with his boss or her boss, the co-workers and the uh, significant others in the organization. And this working requires that they have an excellent understanding of the requirements of the others and their own ways of reacting to the others in the organization. So that means you know, the sometimes you have to work with the individuals in terms of making them better listeners and making them to communicate their ideas to the others and also reduce conflict and tension arguments, such situations which can come because of the poor interpersonal skills. The third kind of asset is definitely the problem solving where they have to be more innovative, more creative at the workplace. So this is particularly true in jobs that are of the non-routine and has lot of variety. You know, such situations demand the employees to be much more uh, proactive, much more applica you know, application driven. So the problem solving skills of employees, if they are deficient, then the management would find it very difficult because then the people tend to become more rigid and they are not able to respond to the changing situations. So that is the time where the, the, the problem solving training would help them to see newer alternatives. And such things also could be to, could be an effort in terms of sharpening their logic, reasoning and also the skills at uh, defining problems and uh, assessing the kind of a causation, uh, deploying some of the tools of uh, uh, like creating a you know a tree problem tree or a kind of a fishbone uh, kind of a diagram things like that so developing alternatives and creativity building analyzing alternatives and judiciously selecting optimal solutions applying the required technology and techniques all these things become relevant when we are talking about the these kind of skill sets we are we are trying to explore could be that the interpersonal skills, the problem solving skills or the technical skills. So conducting a training program has to start with the identification of the training needs. The unless we understand systematically the requirements of the training, then the training program may not give the required results. And not only the training needs to be understood, but an appropriate methodology also has to be developed to meet those identified needs and also monitor systematically the effectiveness and taking those corrective actions. When you see the identifying the needs, you would need to see what are the objectives of the organization. And then we also have to look at the summary of the individual abilities. And then one need to see how is this individual is in a position to meet those uh, 
objectives of the organization and that means a systematic analysis to be done. It could be done through the, the performance appraisal, an analysis of the job requirements, organizational analysis of how overall the performance is improving, could be about the quality or about the delivery and are you achieving 100% all the time. So such things will show us are there any gaps in performance, gaps in attitudes, gaps in understanding and application of the technology, gaps in a poor interpersonal relationship and the survey of human resources. All these things would give some thought about the, the, the training and training uh, gaps. So look at this performance appraisal we have talked about earlier. So that means each employee's work is measured against performance standards or objectives established for his or her job and, and when you look at that, then you will see what are, the, what are the gaps, why the person is not able to meet those expectations on a consistent basis. Another is which can come from the job analysis. The job analysis is a systematic method of collecting the data or the details about various activities one has to perform as a part of the task completion. So when you do that, then you will see what kind of skills and what, is no, what kind of knowledge and uh, required to perform it very effective way and what are some of those minimum things are required in order to start the, the task. So that gives the job description becomes an example of what the individual is supposed to have it. And then when you look at the individual who is going to do the task and what is required, that kind of, that will give a gap about what the training should be and what the training should be delivering. And the employees without necessary skills and knowledge, definitely they become candidates for the training program. So the the identified gaps defines the training agenda. The other what I mentioned earlier is the organizational analysis. The organizational analysis gives a kind of a fair thing about the effectiveness of the or the success of the training activities in meeting the goals. And wherever there are some gaps, wherever there are shortfall in the organizational performance helps to know whether it is because of the attitudes or because of the lack of abilities and competencies. So the members of a department with a high turnover rate or where many people are leaving or low performance record would always throw up, yes, I think there may be lack of leadership, lack of communication, lack of coordination. So many of such things will become more obvious and apparent. As one can I'd look into or analyze these things, can see whether this is a pattern across the organization or whether it is only specific to certain groups, then the focus could be there to address these gaps. That helps to see what are the gaps in, uh, in performance leading to the identification of the training needs. The next important method is to the survey of human resources particularly the managers as well as employees at different levels are asked to describe what are the problems they are experiencing, what problems they have and also what actions are required. What are the current system and what are the desired systems? May it be about the participation, may it be about the involvement, may it be about the infrastructure, may it be about the, the kind of uh, contextual influences coming out of the colleagues and the leaders. All that would throw up the, the idea of what needs to be done and what is that manager should do. Sometimes it may show a lack of managerial capacities as leadership problems. Sometimes it is the absence of the correct coordination mechanisms or absence of the, of the requirement, you know, that some technologies. So the, the idea is that various uh, training approaches one can think of deploying to address those identified uh, problems. So that is where the, the 
conducting and designing of the program becomes very critical. So unless you identify the needs, identify the expected deliverables, it is very difficult to think of the relevance or the appropriateness of the training method. There are many techniques with uh, you know one can always be thinking about you know the so each each issue to be looked into in terms of the particular circumstances and the monitoring the effectiveness is important so the manager should assess the response of the group to the of the you know to the training how they would like to perceive it as and then whether the the training they should be measured in terms of how the individuals are performing and uh, sometimes also by discussing with the with the trainers and the manager would will always wish to know if any further training is required and whether the individuals are now able to produce the with the required skills and what more things to be done so these are the when you are looking at the conducting of the training programs a continuous monitoring always would be most useful and when you look into the monitoring system the appraisal forms becomes an excellent opportunity for the individual to express that the, the training program what one has received or one would like to receive and similarly the manager also can examine the success of the training program and can open up the dialogue what is this uh, have you what is that you have received is it useful to you or to the organization so the conduct of the training program should always be linked to that kind of a a process but training methods all could be classified as on the job or from away from the job the ojts are very widely practiced according to many 90 90 to the 92% of the development happens on the job so on the job training there are a lot of advantages very less exp you know definitely less expensive and there is a positive transfer between the the boss and the subordinate or the trainer and the trainee but then uh, disadvantages are you know the suddenly you know you have to devote some time for dialogue for discussion for demonstration so there is a reduction in productivity sometimes because an untrained person can do with damage to the equipment also can create safety hazards because both the 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 individual is placed on the job without understanding the complete picture of the the machine or the materials or the the kind of things it can happen so suddenly he may switch off and put some hand somewhere and uh, leading to the accidents or creating accident prone conditions to the others and uh, sometimes the current workers may be very bad trainees they are not motivated they they are not well rewarded in the past so they may be questioning the relevance and the focus or the purpose of the training itself so the ojts need to be understood and supported unless it is planned well unless it is understood well can also lead to these kinds of disadvantages then the the training you can see that the uh, it occurs all through the working day so that means a close coordination between the supervisor and the subordinate or the the trainer and the the trainee so it could be you know so the best is that if somebody is not in charge of the not the, you know the daily running of the department could be better now when you see the 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 best of the on the job training many have recorded this it is the most effective teaching method because the person is put on the task guided and makes sure that everything he understands so it is chosen quite deliberately to be the main learning method and uh, definitely as we mentioned it is quite cheap and extremely relevant but when you see the the off the job training so that means you know you have to relate it to the individual and very clearly link to the job and the location also becomes very important at least close to the workplace 
where people can take off and then learn specific things. The methods of uh, training and development, if you see, as you have talked about on the job training and off the job training. And within the on the job training, one can also see these things, coaching, job rotation, and also the training positions and also that means identified areas to work for and uh, making sure it has a kind of a planned work activity. Coaching, if you see, is often used for sporting and or operating skills. So that means, you know, it involves uh, an expert a uh, person who is uh, who can identify with the student can take them through a kind of a guided experience and making sure that there is a learning process. So it is the training of the subordinates by his or immediate uh, supervisors. It often involves the the coach knows how to do or what is to be done, and then uh, you know the the teaching an individual to go against now whatever the views that person has. So that is where the, the one can also see beyond uh, the technical skills. Sometimes you have to work towards their attitude. Sometimes one has to become a role model. Sometimes you have to suggest. So a guide, a coach, an advisor, a mentor, so many of these things are a role model can all be a kind of a different shades of the same issue. But one should also see that you, the mentor and the coach also has to be, they have to be trained. So it is simply one-to-one -one coaching when you are talking about this. So that means an experienced coach who follows the training almost everywhere during the period of training. So. The mentor training is uh, particularly useful and the coaching is, uh, is very good where the, tar, you know, the material to be taught is hard for the, the trainer to learn and convey. So that means one has to be working together to learn from each other and particularly the, the word used shadowing is uh, still one person learning from another but does not use the close uh, teaching relationship. They are working, they are part of the work groups and then keep on learning the small things. The learning the job content of another by just following through a typical period of work and like an apprenticeship or uh, working with a senior person. So the coaching and mentoring and these kinds of things to be more meaningful, lot of, you know, patience one need to have. So the patience in a sense that the adjusting to the requirements of the trainees and uh, they are allowed to work out, allow them to make some kind of errors and then helping through their errors, creating that kind of an opportunity to experiment all this. And definitely it's, a, it's a, an area of risk for many of the seniors and managers. So, but sometimes they just go and tell, do this way, and uh, when they don't, so then they know they may also criticize seriously. So, unless they go through uh, that method of tolerance and patience and have that kind of an attitude, it could seriously affect the effectiveness of the coaching thing. Sometimes the managers feel threatened, the idea of coaching their subordinates just for creating some kind of arrivals. So they may also feel what would happen, what would happen to their own positions, very rare, but it is possible. And also firms with MBA programs make a point of training their managers, particularly in the fine art of coaching. Because if you don't do that, then it could be a very demanding and stress prone experience and the MBO itself may fail. Also mentioned to you about the job rotation. It involves shifting managers, shifting employees, shifting people at different levels from one position to another. I think that's the, the thought in uh, job rotation. So this is done so that they may broaden their experience, 
familiarize themselves with various tasks of the organization, various jobs performed in different departments, so that they get a much broader picture. So a, a generalist versus a specialist, if you see, the job rotation takes care of both. Over a period of time, you can, exp you can develop an employee through a systematic movement within the organization and making sure that he knows different tasks, different jobs, and able to perform at different levels. Sometimes it is also trainees are given a kind of a staff post so that under manager. So that means you work as an assistant too and then, you know, be there with the person and then catch up what all the things done. So such assignments give the trainees a chance to work with and model themselves around the, the, some of the outstanding managers or outstanding technicians. So the training positions are always useful. It is also possible to do the planned work activities like project work or helping them to collect some data and analyze some problems and come up with actionable solutions. So here the, it involves trainees to work on some work assignments so that they develop some experience, they develop familiarity, they also improve their ability to analyze data, to uh, prepare an argument and convince others. So trainees may be also be asked to head a task force or participate in an important meeting. So these are all planned work activities. So but such experiences help them gain insight into, into how uh, complex certain tasks are, how, how to organize, and also to improve their human relations skills. They, 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 that means they experience firsthand. But when you see the off-the-job development techniques, you know, basically you are looking into the removing the individuals from the, from the stresses, from the responsibilities, and the ongoing demands of the workplace, and then we are going to give them a new experience. So focus fully on that kind of a learning experience away from the job situations. So they provide an opportunity for meeting people, particularly from other departments in the organization or sometimes from the other organization. And uh, the, it helps particularly where they have to understand cross-functional inter-organizational issues. And when they come back, they come with much more broader view of the problems and able to see. And the, as we have to put this kind of a view, very clearly we are seeing that the training and development, the, the can be seen in different ways and in different formats, but the OJT and that is on the job training and away from the job training. But what is important is to link these methods to the training needs and assessing the training needs. And once we are able to assess the training needs, then come to the, to the methods. And the, all the three need to be integrated. All the three need to be integrated with respect to the appraisals. The appraisal, the, the method of uh, the, the survey of whatever organizational analysis and the training and the content has to address the common theme of meeting the individual needs as well as the organizational requirements. So when we, when we see these things, Many view this training means it is specific. It is specific uh, in relation to the skill, skill enhancement. And the developments, they see it as much more broader. Broader and it is futuristic, an enhancement of one's potential to contribute to the overall organizational goals. And when procedures are seen, the procedures go beyond the, the just administering the training programs. So it means the training need assessment is much more important than 
be seeing the training effectiveness. But the training effectiveness one has to see in terms of the training policy, the training budgets and then various activities to enhance the overall scope of the activities. And the methods of training also are equally important. The methods of both integration of on the job and the away from the job. But in the next session what we will do, we will try and explore further to these training methods and also look into the importance of the training program. Lack of training program, lack of uh, training initiatives in the organization can lead to a kind of a complacency, the monotony and monotony leading to the poor performance at different levels and poor performance becoming a model for others. So we have seen several organizations getting into serious problem situations because the individual employees are not trained over a period of time. And when their attitudes are rigid, when they see no challenges in their task, and when they are not good in technical, interpersonal and other process skills, they are not in a position to compete at the global level or they are not in a you know, position to face the competition. And the other important area which we need to see the kind of uh, training inputs in terms of the methodology. Today there is a variety of methods and there is a mind blowing uh, methodologies are available because of the, the internet and the web based technology. We do have uh, knowledge repositories, we do have uh, different methods of imparting the, the training using some of these resources. And apart from this the virtual methods of uh, training, but there are uh, classroom based training. Sometimes it can also be training is seen as today as a kind of a guided experience and also is seen as a kind of a rehearsing the known things. So that means the inputs today could vary depending upon the maturity, the, the level of application required and some are seen as more of a capacity building some are seen more as the imparting of the skill set as and when it is required. And when we look at the benefits of training, today we are trying to see more of employability of the individual because fast changing technology, fast changing the demands of the workplace makes everybody to be more functional. So the functional people means that they are also flexible. So you are able to work for the current requirement, you are also able to work for the future requirements. So that is how the, the training today is seen as much more dynamic, much more capacity building and focusing on on the job performance and away from the job performance in terms of the overall growth of the organization and capable of accepting different responsibilities over a period of time and also continuously changing one's orientation depending upon the task and the task performance. We need to see these things and also work on what are the conditions for effective management development. I think management development we are talking about the leadership, we are talking about the, the people who can see and view the organization in its totality and integrate people at different levels for overall performance. These things we will examine in our next lecture.